Hey everybody, welcome! We are going to be talking about emotions today. And this is some great stuff. We all have emotions, but we don't necessarily always know what to do with our emotions. So let's take a look. We're going to be looking at a few different areas. We're going to be checking out facilitative versus debilitative emotions, emotional fallacies, and regulating emotions in a healthy way. And before we get going, we probably should settle on our terms. So let's look um, for our emotion. We can think of it as a mind and body's integrated response to stimulus of some kind. This stimulus can be outside of your body or it can be in your own head, right? Um, but the important part is that it is a connection between your mind and your body. We need to know with facilitative emotions. Facilitative emotions come from the uh, Greek and Latin facile, to be easy. So we're making them easier so they are contributing to effective functioning and making our lives easier. The opposite is debilitative emotions, come from the root word debil, that means to make things harder. Um, and these generally are emotions of high intensity or long duration that prevent a person from effectively um, functioning in a way that they would prefer. And then we have emotional cognition. This is a great concept. This is basically the process by which emotions are transferred from one person to another. If you ever walked into a room and everybody's laughing and you don't know what everybody's laughing at, but you just start laughing yourself, that's emotional cognition. It is related to the mirroring idea from nonverbal communication, right? Like if someone holds a particular stance with their body, we will tend to mirror that other person. And sometimes we do this on purpose, like in an interview when we're trying to get along. Uh, but a lot of the time, it is just something that happens under the radar. It's our tribal instinct. Um, we mirror other people's nonverbals, and their nonverbals and our nonverbals affect our own emotions. So our tribal instincts to belong and get along with other people creates emotional cognition, where we pick up the emotions that other people are feeling. And so let's take a deeper dive. We have facilitated versus debilitative. Now, no emotions are bad, right out. Anger, sadness, happiness, joy, fear, all of these things are natural emotions that we want and need to survive. It's about the strength of the emotion, right? It's natural to become angry. And that can have a really positive benefit because it can spurn you into action to doing something about your life or whatever situation is making you angry. But it can be debilitative when the strength of the anger gets so strong that we start to lose control of ourselves, what we say in our bodies. And the duration of the emotion matters a lot too. Like it's natural to be sad or even a little depressed now and then, right? Um, if you lose a job, you're going to be sad. You might be a little depressed. Same thing with a personal relationship. And that feeling is generally positive, even if we don't like it, because it's showing that our emotions need care. They need to be tended to. It's a warning sign that something has gone wrong in your life and you need to do something about it, right? But it gets debilitative when it goes all the way into um, being constant thought being a thought that's with you all the time, right? It's negative when it hangs out, it pervades too long. Like if you lose a job, being sad is normal, but being so depressed that it inhibits you from getting up and going to get another job, obviously is not good. That's a debilitative emotion. That's what we call that. And we have some other things to help us along to examine these concepts. We look at emotional fallacies that, yes, are pretty much just like the logical fallacies that you'll see in your critical thinking courses, whether you've taken them yet or not. Um, we'll see things like the fallacy of helplessness. It's where you see yourself as a victim. And the problem with it is that it prevents you from taking self-care and action. Uh, we say things like, why should we even try? Or like, they're always doing this to me, as though you have no say and whether or not this stays that way or gets any better. We see this a lot in our, demo, in our democracy and our conversations 
about how democracy functions in this country, right? Why should I even try to vote? Like, nobody listens to me. <laughs> and in, in a bad way, you know, this fallacy of helplessness creates a situation where politicians don't listen to you. <laughs> like, the big reason that politicians in our country take so much money, assuming it's not a bribe, <laughs> is to get advertising, to try to get you to vote for them. That is the end driver. A politician can take tons of money, but if they don't get the votes, they don't win. And if we fall into the fallacy of helplessness, we feel like we don't have any part in this process. And in turn, a politician will go pay attention to someone who is going to be involved in the process, and thereby we genuinely don't have a part in this process. More on that as we move forward. We have the fallacy of overgeneralization. We all do this. Um, it's an inaccurate or misleading instance that causes us to overgeneralize. Uh, say you're taking math and math isn't your strong suit. You study really hard for an exam, but you get a C plus on the first one. It's natural to tell yourself something like, oh, I'll never be good at school, right? But sticking with that emotion and applying it to school in general if maybe this particular subject isn't your strong suit, is overgeneralizing. We have the fallacy of perfection. Let's be clear. Perfect doesn't exist. <laughs> it's not a thing. It's a, if anything, it's a perspective, right? Perfect does not exist. And if we strive for perfect all the time, if we feel that we have to be perfect, it creates a high level of anxiety that eventually leads to procrastination. We just put off doing that thing, put off doing that thing, put off doing that thing because we don't want to mess it up. We don't want to be anything less than perfect. And my favorite phrase for procrastination is procrastination is the name of the grave you bury your dreams in. Get on it, folks. Let's do it today. It doesn't have to be perfect. Done is better than perfect sometimes. And then, of course, we have the fallacy of should. Fallacy of should is when you're not really living in reality. Like, people should whatever. People should be nice. People should have morals, right? Like, we can't control other people and what they do and try to influence them, but we can't control them. And if we live in should, oh, the world should be easier. Oh, that car should be blue. Oh, my mom shouldn't talk to me like that, right? Like it seeps into our emotional life and makes us feel like we can't do anything about it. We can do something about it, but we need to address that fallacy of should first. Because we're not living in should land, we're living in reality that we all share. So what do we do? We take time to process emotions. Yes, it actually takes time. Right? We need to take some time out of our schedule, sit down, and try to work through these thoughts, which isn't what we usually do in our modern day hustle and bustle. It takes focused, intentional effort, and we're going to look at some of that later on, but know that it is well worth the time. Well, it's well worth the time only if you want to have a fulfilled and contented life. If you don't care about being happy or content, don't worry about it. Never pay attention to your emotions. Never give some time to tend to them. Uh, you won't be happy. You won't be content. And it'll be fine. The easiest lens to look through this is you take care of other parts of your life, right? You take care of other parts of your body, right? You shower. Maybe not every day, but you do it. You brush your teeth. Maybe not every day, but you do it, right? We take care of our physical body. And an emotion is part physical, part mental. We need to take time to take care of our emotions. So how do we do it? Well, we start off by minimizing debilitative emotions. Those are the bad ones, right? How do we minimize? Well, first things first, we record our self-talk. We actually write down the negative thoughts that we have. Uh, and it's best if you get a pen or pencil in hand and actually write this on paper. And there's something magical that happens in the human experience when the mind needs to slow down enough so that you can actually move the pen fast enough that things bubble to the surface that otherwise won't if you're just talking or talking to someone else or thinking out loud or just sitting and quietly contemplating. We record that self-talk 
so that we can change that self-talk. And we do that by disputing irrational beliefs. Like, again, actually write them down. See, are these thoughts debilitative? Are they getting in the way? Are they possibly leading or living in an emotional fallacy? Something like, I'm not a very tall guy. <laughs> like, I know you can't see on this video, I'm about five foot three. Um, and typically shorter gentlemen, you don't see that in the world of professional sports. So if I told myself I'm never gonna be good at sports because I'm a short guy, that's an irrational belief that can be disputed by the fact that I'm really strong and I'm, I'm really athletic and I've actually had a lot of athletic success. So when we write them down, we can see them on paper and we can dispute them and engage in the process of self-fulfilling prophecy in action. Yes, it has popped up again and it will pop up again and again because we can use that self-fulfilling prophecy to help us grow. How do we do that? Well, we do it by maximizing our facilitative emotions, those good ones, in a pretty similar way. We actually write down our self-talk. We write down those positive con, uh, those positive thoughts. I like to do it on the same piece of paper right next to those negative thoughts. Sometimes I do this in the same session. Lots of times I find it's better if I take a break for even 20 minutes or half an hour. We actually write down those positive thoughts so that you can change your self-talk, right? You can change your self-talk. Some of this is not rocket science. You've heard it before by repeated messages, right? Again, you actually write these things down. Um, when I'm working with an emotion of particular strength, I use a dry erase marker and I write it on my bathroom mirror so that I can say it to myself over and over and over. It's like that book of the train engine. I think I can, I think I can think I can. Thomas, the train engine, was engaged in a process of maximizing his facilitative emotions by repeated positive messaging because it reinforces what we see ourselves doing in the world and then we take action to realize those goals. That's the gift of cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is tip came to us from the world of psychology. Um, everybody needs therapy every now and then. It's not a big deal. Seems every couple of years, maybe two to four years, I get something stuck in my craw and I need to have a trained professional I can air out my thoughts with and they can bounce thoughts back to me, right? But we don't have to go see a therapist. This does stuff that we can do all on our own when we find ourselves getting caught up in our emotions. So remember, the relationship between the self-concept the self-esteem and behavior. We talked about it earlier in the semester. Uh, we, we talked about how we conceive ourselves, how we feel about ourselves, and how that affects our behavior. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy in action, and it works. And just to remind you, this is our self-fulfilling prophecy cycle. On the left, we see a debilitative cycle, right? A person is nervous about their communication style, maybe nervous to talk to an authority figure, maybe a police officer or a professor. And when they go and talk to them, that person stammers and blushes a little because those emotions are running high and they can't quite think straight, right? And then they don't usually get a very good response or at least they perceive they don't get a very good response. And if you remember from perception, whatever you perceive and believe, is what will happen really for you. And then your perception of those events, this is where it becomes that self-talk. Like, oh, they didn't think much of me. Oh, I'm no good at this. And then it goes round and around and around. So that the next time we have an opportunity, we genuinely believe we're not gonna be good at it. We sit down, we write out those thoughts. It is illogical to think that we can't improve our communication stuff. Just tell yourself, I can do better. I can be better. I don't have to be perfect. I can do better. I can be better. I don't have to be perfect. And then we start to fall in with a facilitative style over on the right, where we're comfortable with authority figures. Uh, at least we're more comfortable. And so when we go to speak to a police officer or a professor, we're more calm, we're more fluent. The words tend to come out because we don't have all that stress and negative self-talk getting in the way, at least not as much of it. 
and then our the response we get from our conversation partner, they're going to be a lot more positive, or at least we will perceive them to be a lot more positive, right? Uh, they don't necessarily have to be that way. If we feel that they're more positive, uh, they could be the exact same response, but we're going to feel that they're more positive because we're going to notice the positive things that they do. And we'll take from that situation a whole new line of self-talk. I think I handled that pretty well, especially positive self-talk when you had to put in an effort to handle it better. And round and round it goes in the facilitative cycle. Um, the facilitative cycle winds up leading to a happy, well-balanced emotional life. Um, and then the debilitative cycle, which we all have, and it's totally fine. We just need to maintain it, record and contradict some of our self-talk so that we can pull out of those situations in life. And they're going to come up over and over. So we just need to practice these tools. Don't be too hard on ourselves. Don't should yourself. Oh, I shouldn't get mad. You got mad. <laughs> Examine the emotion and see what happened. Odds are there's a reason behind it that you can do something about. So that's our talks about emotions. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Have a great day.